Hey, Matt. Hey, Tim. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing good. It's good to see you tonight. You too. This is fun. This is fun. I put the, well, now you can't see it. I put this up for you tonight. I thought you'd appreciate that. <laughs> I noticed it first thing, even before yeah. I got on. I'm like, it's unguarded. Look at that. <laughs> well, I'm excited. Thank you for joining me. Of course. It's an tonight. honor. How are you? How, how, have, well, how are you? Let me ask that. Today has been a whirlwind. I am still teaching school full time. Uh, this is our last week. So, um, wow. yeah, but I just got off of like a, a staff and faculty appreciation meeting on Zoom that was really cool. And uh, yeah, so now I'm here with you. And this is, yeah. this is fun. I, uh, you know, you're somebody who you and I have known each other on social media for several years. I want to say like, really? 15. Yeah. Oh my gosh. 15. So, at so, least. Yeah. But this is, I think, only the second actual conversation we've had, like face to face. Face to face. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, this is really cool. Well, and this is, you know, it's kind of um, what well, is fitting because it was the music that brought us together. Yes. In the absolutely. first place. And we had a lot of commonality um, growing up in the church, uh, liking the very different kinds of CCM than a lot of other people liked mm -hmm. uh, in a very different time. Right. Not not dating us or anything <laughs> like that, but <laughs> but I well and I, let's start. I want to say this on the I'm going to say this on the front end and I'm going to say this on the back end as well because I want to make sure um, people, you know, there's a lot going on in the world in this yes, moment, and so I want to I want to start by acknowledging the deaths of George Floyd. Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade at the hands of police departments in our country. Yes. Um, I've put a list of resources that were sent to me today uh, by my friend Odessa Moon here in Nashville. She's a great activist here. Uh, you can follow her at I am Odessa Moon. Um, but, uh, and I, I retweeted her post on Instagram. Uh, but there is a list of resources it ranges from attorneys uh, for protesters that get arrested and need counsel, uh, instructions on what to do if you are detained. Share, uh, there's methods there on how to share things on social media in the most helpful way so that the people who they're intended for see them. Mm -hmm. uh, places you can donate if you're able, organizations. Um, they're organized by state and by the type of organization. So that link is in my bio. And uh, if you are in any way interested in supporting uh, the cause against police brutality, uh, then please go to that link. It's a Google Doc, and it's going to point you in the right direction where you fit uh, for what you feel your heart is in organizing and aiding in this work. So, and thank you to everybody that is protesting and mm -hmm. that is using their voice in whatever way they are. Uh, to raise awareness and to make change. You're making the world a better place for everyone. So thank yeah, you. Absolutely. So connected to that, we are here tonight to talk about two albums uh, that came into my life before I was 10 years old. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so Terry DeSerio, great singer songwriter, um, Many people don't know. They know her from the disco era. Right. Uh, she did a song produced by Barry Gibb called Ain't Nothing Gonna Keep Me From You and still gets a lot of play all over the world. Um, but she had a life after that in contemporary Christian music. And that's how, I think that's how you heard her, right? Or did you right. know Terry's work from? No. Okay. Oh, no, I, you know, Tim, I, I grew up not listening to secular music. So, yeah, yes. there was none of that in my house. Yeah. Talk a little, well, and let's talk about that. Let's start okay. there before we get to Terry, because this is, I mean, I talk to younger people in particular and younger people in church, and they have no uh, connection with the fact that there was, that secular music was restricted. Yeah. Well, in my life, I grew up in Northern Indiana and uh, I, when I was in first grade, I think my parents uh, had like a born again experience in a mm -hmm. little free Methodist church. 
and they wanted their family to have that same experience. And so we all started going to that church like all the time, uh, three times a week. Uh, wow. We were even the church janitors. So, <laughs> so we were there on Tuesdays and Saturdays also. So five days a week for us. And, wow. um, and we started going to a Christian school uh, in okay. second grade. And I went to uh, like a, a fundamentalist evangelical Christian school from second grade all the way up through high school and then even in college. And I remember, you know, I, I remember music. I mean, music has always been a huge part of my life. I was singing and playing and whatever from the time I can remember. Um, and we had records in our house. My mom and dad were big uh, music fans too. And I remember when I was very young, they had tons of records, the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and all these things. But wow. when they got saved in this kind of like evangelical environment, uh, that was considered worldly and, and a bad influence. And so they got rid of all of those records. And from that moment on, about second grade for me, it was all Christian music all the time. And we listened to Christian radio in the car. We had Christian records that we listened to at home. And in my early years, I remember a lot of like the Imperials and the Bill Gaither trio and kind of some on the Southern gospel or trio kind of side, because my dad yep. was mostly into that. Um, but then we also listened to, you know, kind of Christian, contemporary Christian radio. And mm -hmm. so we got to know more of the kind of more mainstream CCM artists, Amy Grant, Sandy Patty, uh, so on and so forth. And I just was, I loved music so much. They were, they were like some kids are, you know, freaking out over Backstreet Boys or Britney Spears. I was so excited. My first concert, the Imperials and Michelle Pilar. And let me tell you, I was wow. so excited, <laughs> so excited. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's interesting because that was like my first big concert. Really? The Imperials with Michelle Pilar. Paul yeah. Smith had just become the lead singer. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then Mylon headlined. Mylon uh, headlined okay. that show. It was really something. But, and so to give, I want to give, really want to build this up for people because it wasn't like this, these people were just in this Christian bubble and everybody loved them. When Mylon hit the stage at that concert that night, people walked out. Uh, mm. I mean, people were offended. And this was at a, a, a the Sun Dome. This wasn't even at a church. Yeah. And people were just repelled by, mm. it was almost, you know, they thought it was like demonic in yeah. some sense. And so yeah. I, was re I really like stressing for people that this was not bubblegum, middle of the road music for church people. This was really pushing the envelope. Yeah, absolutely. Think, so to say also I had the same experience secular music was strictly forbidden yeah forbidden well my mother would hide Bee Gees and Barry Manilow eight tracks under the seat in her car <laughs> so that my grandparents didn't see them so I, I have a question actually because it, it was yeah. kind of a strange double standard when I look back on it now like we could not listen to pop or rock music but country music was kind of okay jazz music kind of okay some of the like novelty songs i remember green alligators and long you know some of these like folky novelty songs those were fine walt disney records no problem so for us anyway in my home like there was this kind of like there's okay secular music and then there's really bad secular music and anything on pop radio was bad and anything you know anything else was was tolerated well and do you remember because we're, we're we're really close in age the uh peters brothers I do. do. They came to my college, Tim. No. I sat through a presentation called Why Knock Rock Why by knock the Peters rock. Brothers. Yeah. So that was at my right. college. This was like freshman See? year of college. Gosh. Yeah. So let's, I mean, I so let's, for the people that don't know, like, let's, <laughs> the Peters Brothers were these two guys that made a living going to churches, mm -hmm. schools, Christian and colleges. You know, like, Christian colleges yep. and educating people about the dangers of uh, rock and roll. music. Yeah, and they would and for that with a record burning, right? Uh, we didn't have a record burning at my school, although that wouldn't surprise me in the least. It was it was a very slick presentation. They had slides and pictures, and I remember at the time I was one of the writers for our student newspaper, and I was a little subversive. I remember writing a kind of a satire piece after this about just how like, how obvious, like 
the thing that kind of cracked me up even then was they would like show pictures of an album cover with like a half naked woman on it. And they would like, it was kind of like they were show like, this is Bet Kids, look, a half naked woman, you know, and then they put her up on the screen and it was kind of like, I mean, duh, like none of us are, <laughs> this is not like revelatory to us. You know what I'm saying? Right. The, the interesting thing for, for them, of course, was they got into the lyrics and they put all the lyrics up on the screen. And then there was backward masking too. I'm sure you remember backward masking. I do, yes, yes. Because they would even, so, they would backward mask the Christian records too, if yeah, you remember, yeah, that show. became a thing. Because mm -hmm. if, yeah. you, if you played the record backwards, you'd hear these seemingly ominous voices saying evil things like 666 or Satan rules or whatever. The messages yeah. you were intended to receive, not the <laughs> messages that were in the actual songs. So exactly. in all of that, Terry DeSario comes into uh, contemporary Christian music. Um, out of disco so she but that's the okay so double standards i also want to say this there was an interesting cachet for secular artists who came into christian music yeah well they were like they were like a catch they were like a find right like ooh, we got we got a secular artist to do a christian record so that yes. like somehow elevates the 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 faith or the message or our brand or whatever Yes. I remember yes. a lot of kind of like uh, R&B artists like did a one-off gospel record, you know, like mm -hmm. there, there was a lot of that, I think, too, back in the 80s. The guys especially. from Brothers Johnson mm -hmm. uh, did that as a group called Passage, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. uh, in the early 80s. And Bonnie Bramlett yes. came over, Maria Moldar. Mm -hmm. and of I course, remember Denise Williams had gospel albums. She did. That I loved. Philip, yeah. Philip Bailey, who we'll talk about. Yes, uh, Bailey. So Terry comes in, though, and it's a very um, uh, different sound. It was not disco. To me, I mean, we listen to it today, and we go, oh, yeah, this is adult contemporary music. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. back then, this was like, is it, uh, I mean, I read one review that said it was there was some techno mm -hmm. on it. Uh, and so, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's interesting. Um, but the messaging on this record, A Call to Us All, was really um, unique to me. And I heard, I remember hearing something in these records as a kid that, um, like I'd heard when I listened to Reba Rambo, you know, the first voice I ever heard that said, this is different. This is different than your grandparents, Jesus. This is a little different. Yeah. And I felt, you know, a commonality mm -hmm. with the message. Mm -hmm. And so, there was a, uh, Terry was not, um, she was not preachy. She was idealistic mm -hmm. in a lot of senses and creating and interested in presenting the way it should be mm. or the way it could be, I think. Yeah. yeah. So, I, you know, when I first heard her, though, it was a song from this first record called I Dedicate All My Love to You. That was my first song by her. That too. was your first song. Yeah. So where yeah. where were you? I want I love I love these oh, stories. I imagine I was probably in the car in the carpool on the way to my Christian school, and we were listening to WFRN Elkhart South Bend, one hundred four point seven, uh, on the FM dial, and uh, yeah, I'm sure that's where I heard it first. And and I okay. remember her voice to me was just so clear and pure and strong. Um, it wasn't belty at all. And, no. and that stood out to me. It was her head voice. I wouldn't have known how to articulate it back then, but it was this strong, clear, crisp, and her lyrics were so, like, you could hear every word. It was just really beautiful. And I remember, like, probably just me in the car with seven other kids bouncing on my way to school, but that stood out to me. And I remember thinking it was so beautiful. Um, and she had, you know, I listened again to both albums today so many interesting chord changes, so many uh, key changes, a lot of really interesting and unique things for pop music, I think. And yes, it's adult contemporary, but some really beautiful uh, choices in the arrangements. And I think even back then that stood out to me. You know, I, I think of that last, evermore, at the very end, it's like, ooh, yes. it's, it's different. It's not dissonant, but it's not what you expect. 
And I remember really loving yes. that. Yeah. Well, and that was, you know, uh, the first single, by the way, I dedicate all my love to you, uh, hit the top 10 mm. in Christian radio, uh, number 16 for the nerds on uh, contemporary Christian music's chart, and then number 10 okay. on their adult contemporary chart. Um, came out in August of 1983. Mm. And so you know, there was a uh, lot of good press. I mean, she, it was a slow builder though. And so this is the other thing that in looking back at the magazines and tracking the, the movements on the chart and the release mm -hmm. date and is albums back then, which we don't anymore, albums come out and the next week they're over. And this right. album built for a year. Mm -hmm. mm. It built for an entire year with four singles. Oh, wow. um, before it and it was a year before it even hit the sales chart mm. which today just you know i think lizzo is probably our greatest <laughs> example in recent yeah. times but back then that was pretty normal for a record yeah. company to let an album build yeah such a different time too i i was one of those kids who subscribed to ccm from the time i was like 11 years old everything i read it cover to cover i was so so into it of course i wanted to be you know a ccm cover artist someday but um but yeah. boy did i read every word and that's how i discovered a lot of my music too was by reading that and by hearing comparisons and stuff like that um but it, the one thing i think is interesting is i remember knowing somehow i'm not sure how probably from ccm that terry was a catholic and i yes. think that that is true which was very unusual at the time for a CCM artist to be non-Protestant, right? Because most CCM artists are just kind of like down home, earthy Southern Baptist evangelical, you know? And Terry was this kind of mystical Catholic. And, yes. and I knew that I could see it in her music and hear it in her words, but I also knew it from reading. And I, I don't know if that was in CCM or what, but was. I, I had a sense that, that Terry was a Catholic artist. And to me, Catholicism was kind of like evil and other and kind of like, religious but not Christian and and I kind of was suspicious of it but also fascinated by it well there's the whole element of and of course I, we know this is like single digit children or you know 10 years 10 year old children <laughs> but there's an element of um, Catholicism that is rooted in the mystical and rooted in the I mean for odd you know oddly for a lot of the beliefs, but at the core of it, um, the feminine, you mm -hmm. know, there's yeah. a deep connection to feminine spirituality. Absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, well, and when I interviewed John Still, the former uh, publisher and editor of CCM, he told me that uh, being a Catholic was almost akin to being gay in the Christian right. music industry. Mm -hmm. And so there was that kind <laughs> of taboo Right. Um, hi, Patsy. I see Patsy Moore watching. I know. And um, Tammy Sue Baker also. Hi. Hey, Tammy Sue. Hey, Sissy. Um, so, you know, there's uh, a lot of stigmas right at the beginning that Terry was <laughs> confronting. And then, well, and let's talk about this title song, A Call to mm -hmm. Us All. And I still don't know how this ever came out on a Christian label. I am amazed. I really am. Uh, so th this is the lyric. Uh, There's a call to us all to love all humanity. Every race on the face of earth come to unity. Uh, love your neighbor as yourself. These the master's words would do us well. But man's belief, religious creeds can make him blind. The narrow way is not a narrow mind. Love mm -hmm. eliminates all the fear and hate. It illuminates the soul. Love will make us whole. There's a call to us all to love all humanity. Every race on the face of earth come to unity. Reach a hand to the Hindu mother and a hand to the Buddhist father and love. Love one another as I've loved you. Hold the hands of a Muslim baby and you'll see we're all created by God. We're mm -hmm. all in the image of God. It gets me every yeah. time I read it. It's beautiful to me. I remember... You know, I was also the kid that read the liner notes and knew every word, and I would listen to the album again and again and again. And and I remember, like, looking back on it now, I just remember these feelings inside, but I couldn't hardly 
name. I couldn't at the time. Uh, and they were kind of, I think, hopeful feelings. And they were kind of like, uh, what's the word? Like subversive feelings. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I, knew. <laughs> I knew there was something subversive about this. And I could kind of explain it away. And I suspect this is how label executives did. They would be like, well, yeah, of course, we're supposed to love all people. Of course, we're supposed to love the Muslim and the Hindu and the Buddhist and know that they're all creative. I got, of course, we, we can't deny that. They would, of course, draw the line, you know, about are these people included in God's kingdom? Are these people headed for heaven or hell? And, and back then I would have too, I didn't know any different, but I had a sense deep down that there was something true and subversive about these words. And if you continue on in the lyrics, it says, sweet salvation calls the nations with his voice. Every man who hears must make a choice. Who are we to know another's heart or mind? For God alone is judge, he loves all kinds. Yes. And I just, like that right there, that's the subversiveness. That's where she says, who are we to say who's in and who's out? You know what? God that's made right. all these beautiful people. And we see, you know, this brilliant, beautiful diversity. And I remember at the end of the song, of course, it goes into this beautiful instrumental where you're With hearing like sitar and tablas and all of these like uh, instruments from India and, and that are kind of representative of these other religions. Yes. And that right there was where I started to feel like all the feels of like, ooh, this is really, <laughs> wow, something, this is blowing my mind, you know, as a 12 year old or whatever I was at the time. Yes. This is really, really out there. Well, and I want to share because I, I, I wrote my undergraduate thesis uh, as a college student uh, on the women some of the women in contemporary Christian music, the women that I felt were incredibly uh, overlooked and distinct in the story. And Terry was one of those women. So she interviewed with me for my thesis and she shared with me that uh, A Call to Us All originally had a different chorus. Mm. And the lyric was originally, there's a call to us all to love all humanity, every race on the face of earth come to unity. Reach a hand to your Hindu sister and a hand to your Buddhist brother in love. Hold the hands of a Muslim baby and you'll see we're all the children of God. Ooh, yeah, yeah. So that's the original lyric. And she said that's how she would sing it when she went out live. Oh, so that's Okay. An executive, uh, the album, and I'm still trying to find this. So there, the original printing, the first printing of the album that went out, had those original lyrics on it. Oh my gosh. And, we need to hear this. Uh, we need you to yeah, find I this. To, I, I am working like crazy to get this. Uh, I believe and in you. And <laughs> it went out uh, to, they would send records to pastors and critics originally uh, mm -hmm. before it went to stores. And a pastor wrote and said, yes, uh, it said the, the vice president of the label told Terry, I uh, received a letter from a person that listened to the album and they had a scriptural difference with your lyrics. Uh, and she asked what it was. And they said, well, you, when you state that we are all the children of God, this person quotes scripture, which contradicts you. Scripture says we are not all the children of God. You're the child of the devil unless you're a Christian. Yeah. And I said, well, no, <laughs> that is not in the Bible. <laughs> And she said that they began to debate and ultimately she was given an ultimatum to change the lyric and the album would be shelved or mm. to um, modify it and the album would come out. So she chose to modify it. But when she went out live, she sang it mm. with her original lyric. It's a great story. Um, and so I think it's important also, like there was, I think at that time, just the fact that the album got that far <laughs> with yeah. the original lyric and that it came out in with that being the only modification mm, yeah. really says a lot about uh, the ways that people were within the business were able to converse about difference mm -hmm. that I think really counters where we are today. Yeah. Yeah. Cause she would have just been blacklisted, um, you know, had this happened. Um, even a decade Today. later, right? I or mean, a if, decade if, later. Even in the 90s, I, I don't think that, that could have happened. 
in the yeah. 90s. Mm. So this album did come out to astounding success somehow. Uh, but I also think that's a testament to um, a lot of the uh, varying ears that were hearing Christian music at the time. Um, I'm laughing. Someone asking, are you homophobic? We're two gay men, honey. Bless your heart. Um, we are far from homophobic. <laughs> far from homophobic, honey. Uh, wish you well. Um, <laughs> so it's interesting that um, the album expanded her reach, expanded her audience, mm -hmm. and uh, the path from that record took her into uh, even dicier territory. Um, yeah. Did you hear, like at the time, did you get to see Terry in concert? Mm -mm. You never did? Never. No, we had a lot, of, a lot of Christian artists came through South Bend, Indiana, a lot, because we had two big Christian radio stations there. And it was like, I mean, might as well be the heart of the, the Bible Belt. You know, it was really a, a strong place. So I saw tons of artists growing up. Um, I mean, dozens and dozens. Uh, there were festivals even that would come through. So I, I saw a lot, but, but not Terry Desario. And back yeah. in the day, that was when I first heard A Call to Us All, I was still relatively young. I was 12 or 13. And I was still kind of new to this, like, like manic uh, consumption of music. <laughs> so yeah, so she might have come through. I don't know, but I never got to see her. How about you? Did you see her yeah. live? I never saw Terry live. I did see her, uh, of all places, on TBN, um, oh. promoting a call to us all. And she did. Okay. I still I actually have the footage. Um, oh, really? We got to put that yeah, on YouTube. I, yeah, she did uh, Battle Line. Uh, yeah. And I want to say Dig a Little Deeper. And I didn't get all of um, ah. Dan, uh, Dan Childers, our friend here, says his wife is from South Bend. Oh, nice. Uh, um, so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> should visit the Christian Closet, actually. This might be a good moment yes. for a plug for the Christian oh, Closet. So, so, so we, we have someone in the comments saying, I'm gay, but I don't want to be. What do I do? Uh, I mean, this isn't exactly the conversation that we're having here tonight but right i can tell you that for a very 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 long time i also did not want to be gay and i tried my very best to change that uh i did reparative therapy i did counseling i did prayer and healing deliverance and all kinds of stuff i was married to a woman for 23 years so uh yeah you can you can try all you want but i can tell you from experience and from many 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 brothers who have also tried the same thing that it doesn't work. And I think ultimately the most important thing that you can do for yourself is to accept reality, know that you are created in God's image, even as the beautiful gay human being that you are, and and embrace it and live openly. And you can be a Christian and gay at the same time. It's actually something because that's my story. So yes, we have lots of resources for you. Come to the Christian closet and you can uh, hear all about it. But anyway, back right. to the music. <laughs> yes. And we just got somebody blocked in the comments. So bless their hearts. <laughs> um, All right. Finally figured out how to do that. When it's your first nice. live, you're just kind of going, oh, do I have to watch these horrible things people are saying? <laughs> oh, no, I don't have to. There's a block button nope. that I can access. Good for you. I just reach up. So it'll keep coming. Um, so we also wanted to, so Terry became, after a call to us all, she became one of uh, the most sought after songwriters in mm. Christian music. And she was writing for a lot of people. She was a staff writer at Word, uh, okay. Word Music. And so her first cut, you know, a little interesting note was for Johnny Erickson. I don't know oh. if you remember, or Joni, as many people said, uh, Joni Erickson. <laughs> Joni Erickson. Called Run that. That. That's right. right. Uh, called Run That Race. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, run that race and okay. uh from there she started writing for a lot of people um sheila walsh great cuts for sheila walsh which i think we'll talk mm -hmm. about too uh i, I to do want to today yes yes i had some interesting thoughts listening to those songs today by yeah, sheila that terry wrote 
Uh, but Philip Bailey of Earth, Wind, and Fire. There he is. Can we see him? Yeah, we yep. can see him. This was his first CCM record called mm -hmm. The Wonders of His Love. And Terry wrote the title track. And uh, sang with, it. Yes, and was featured on the song with, with mm -hmm. uh, Philip. And I think this is a continuation in many ways of a call to us all. Absolutely, yeah. I always jokingly call Terry the, um, the Christian Wiccan as well, because <laughs> <laughs> not really, but so much of her lyricism centered around nature and pointing yes. us to the earth. Yes. Um, as, a, as like a divine being almost. I mean, she even personifies it in Celebrate. You know, she talks about she, her, she uses that feminine language to talk about the earth. Yeah. Yes. So there's so a the lot wonders of, of A lot of that. The wonders of his love. This is, I mean, the lyricism is just so beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, the beating drums in deep forgotten forest floors, a rhythm dance in tribal doors, reach the river shore, pounding the wonders of his love. A samba sways in cooling rain while sun gets hot. Siesta time, they close the shop. The guitars gently rock, strumming the wonders of his love. Oh, eyes have seen all the ordinary things of every day. They're more than what they seem. Yes, ears have heard all the symphonies of sound in every way, telling all the wonders of his love. I love it. It's beautiful. Yeah. So it also reminds me a lot of a, a Reap Rambo oriented lyric. Uh, mm -hmm. Just the, the play with words is so yeah. gorgeous. And hold on one more second. Just got to deal with this. <laughs> Dealing with comments. Yeah. All right. I think we've got one more to go. No, I got him. All right. All right. Yes. Um, yeah, I see Reba. Um, the wonders of his love. So this this lyric to me also is the heart of Terry Desario. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In many ways. Um, I also forgot we talked about this other song earlier today. I don't want to go back. I want to go back to a call to us all because. Why don't you talk about Clouds Without Water? Oh, yeah. Uh, Clouds Without Water is, you know, again, it's, it's this very, like, it's long, it's interesting, it's got orchestral arrangement, it's got this big, long, uh, it, it, it's, first of all, it's in a minor key, so it's very dramatic and uh, serious and sober sounding. And I, I believe, I really wish I had looked this up, but I believe that it's based on a scripture from the, uh, the book of Jude in the New Testament. And she, the chorus says, are we clouds without water, trees with no fruit, doubly dead because we've no root, like a storm driven sea, wandering clouds, doomed to eternity, doomed for eternity to the dark. So it's really kind of a dark lyric. And she's kind of talking about um, the, the, the anti-God, the opposite of God, you know, yes. and, um, and it, it's pretty stark you know, doomed to eternity, to the dark. That's, that's a dark lyric. Um, and there's, there's one, one line that I, I texted you earlier. I'm trying to remember what it says. Something about... Um, we sit with uh, our Bibles. Oh, yeah, yeah. We call ourselves Christians, a name after you, and yes. then we deny you by the things that we do. And, you know, it's funny, back, back then, as a, as a little evangelical gay boy who was still in the closet and... I would oftentimes internalize lyrics like that about like my thought life, like, oh, I, I, you know, I'm lusting after this boy or whatever. So I'm like uh, spoiling the name of Jesus or whatever, you know what I mean? Like I, I call myself a Christian, a name after you, but then I deny you by the things that I do. Like I, I think this thought or I, I have these feelings. And so I, yes. I must be, and I would, I would heap a lot of shame on myself back then because of those things and because of the community and culture I lived in. But now, you know, I was thinking about that lyric specifically in reference to what happened with Donald Trump, sorry to say the name, um, a couple nights ago when he cleared the area around the Episcopal Church in Washington DC with tear gas and then marched down there holding up a stupid, a Bible 
and and for a photo op and and i you know kind of lost my shit and and went on facebook and wrote a big post about it and everything because i i, I was like i think in my post i said listen i know people don't like to talk about politics and religion together but the man just walked onto our front porch and held up a bible and made a statement and i can't be silent about it as a christian and as a pastor and i, I think that that right there and the people that continue to support fascism and military dominance and police brutality and then dare to call themselves evangelicals when i look at the 81 percent of white evangelicals that supported our president that's the kind of i mean i feel like that lyric speaks to them we call ourselves christians a name after you and then we deny you by the things that we do and if i don't man if donald trump holding a bible up in front of that uh episcopal church after invoking like the powers of the military to come and dominate protesters that to me is a perfect example of that lyric and it's not it's not pretty it's it's pretty bold and um and i think appropriate for things like that where i see the name of jesus literally just being being used as a battering ram at, by bullies you know and, and that's the state of our world today in many ways it is sorry i i got preaching tim you got a no. <laughs> you got a pastor here so you know, I'm going to preach when I can. That's why I called you. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's, well, and there's two connections I think we can make to what you just said outside of Clouds Without Water, because yeah. on the next album, Terry would really um, confront the yes. ideologies that she experienced brewing uh, particularly within fundamentalist circles yes. um, that she clearly stood very apart from. And so when mm -hmm. she got to Voices in the Wind, her second record, she had also, uh, and this was not, you know, in any of the CCM articles, but this is what we've learned later, she had embraced um, feminism mm. and was working with um, uh, feminist nuns. Mm -hmm. uh, in learning about the saints, the women saints. Yeah. And so a lot of what we hear on Voices in the Wind that is very counter to, uh, I mean, there's, there's two songs in particular, but one of them speaks directly to Christian militarism. Yes. Um, and that idea, two songs actually, <laughs> uh, that deal with that. Um, because she said, you know, to me in our interview that she saw what was building and she said, they're going to take over the government. Mm -hmm. And that was 30 years ago. Well, it was, you know, it was like she, what, 1985, five. something like that. Ronald Reagan was president. The religious right was coming into power back then. Um, yeah. You know, AIDS was just starting to, to be known and yet our president wouldn't name it. And this is kind of during those years is when kind of the, the, the right wing Republicans that we know today were being born. I, you know, yes. like that, that was the movement. It was Jerry Falwell and it was uh, uh, James Dobson and the, the, the rise of the religious right as a political force. Um, yes. And that happened in the early 1980s. So that was right about the time she was living and writing these, these lyrics, you know. And it's what moved her into Catholicism at the time. Yeah. Because she started not in a Catholic church and then she mm. moved um, over. Okay. Um, so I don't want to be a soldier. I really want to, again, I love reading her lyrics because they just really do say it all. I don't want to be a soldier marching off to war, justified by a man-made cause, all in the name of the Lord. And I won't carry any banner or step out proudly to the drum or ravage others when I disagree just to win and overcome all in the name of the Lord. So you could hear that through a particular lens <laughs> if you stop at the chorus, depending yeah. on what you believe. But she clarifies this. Oh, yeah. uh, see him in the barrio in the inner city, surrounded in an alleyway, shot down dead for stealing money. See him on the reservation, drunk on stinging water, trying hard to drown the memory of his people's slaughter. See him in the Nazi camps, a child at the gallows, offered as a sacrifice, her mother stabbed with sorrow. See him victim in El Salvador, raped and murdered at the roadside. We don't ever recognize the Holy One, and so we kill him again and again and again and again. Yeah. Yeah, those are bold lyrics for 1985 in evangelical Christianity. I mean, that, that is like, I, I do not know 
how this record got made, Tim. I don't know. I, I don't know. <laughs> like, I, just, I, I really want to interview the executives and ask them what they were thinking <laughs> when they heard it, because that it, I'm so grateful for it, because for me, as a kid who grew up in an extremely rigid, uh, right-wing, terrifying home, Mm. um in that sense politically and um spiritually just terrifying it was terrorism it was christian terrorism Tim, can I, and i'm curious is that how you experienced it at the time did you realize that it was that or is yes. it only looking back that you see it as as a terrifying no. oh did i you no know, i knew it was terrifying i okay. knew that i was terrified of my grandparents okay okay <laughs> they were terrifying people uh they were so um, convinced. Mm. And I was always, uh, as I mean, as small as I can remember, I was the kid that said, why? Mm. Yeah. No. Mm -hmm. I loved no. Mm. Uh, and so no and why were really um, key for my survival. And I didn't know that at the time. My grand, I remember my grandfather would always say to me, why can't you just get along? Why can't you just get along? And it just was not in my that DNA. Mm -hmm. No. And thankfully, I mean, we had these women, we had these women that were raising the signal for us. So when I heard, I don't want to be a soldier, I went, oh, I want to know her. Mm -hmm. I was 10. I mean, yes. I went, I want to know this woman. I need to know who she is. Yeah. Um, and Dan, no, these albums are not available digitally, <laughs> which is a shame. It really is. Um, I mean, even sonically, I, I just think, I listened again today, of course. They're just beautifully produced. They're beautifully arranged. Uh, I, I, it is a shame that they're not available digitally. I have them just, I don't know, some MP3 site I found yeah. years ago. It might have been yours back in the day. I don't know, but... Uh, but I'm grateful that I have them, you know, and I'm grateful I've got the yes. iTunes Match subscription so they stay in the cloud for me. But yeah, it's um, it's too bad. Well, too and this is probably a good moment to say Mike Curb owns the Masters, and Mike Curb is a good man. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that, you know, somehow Mike Curb will hear this and encourage his employees at Curb Music mm -hmm. uh, to make these important, important albums available yeah. again, because yeah. these are... Um, documents that yep. counter the narrative that's out yep. there right now yes and yep. i mean i personally feel like it's why they were hidden for so long mm -hmm. it's why these albums never made it even to cd at the time yeah. right right um but i think it's important uh for the world that knows who terry deserio was from her secular music to hear these records as well because this changes the perceptions uh of what christian music yes. was and what it could be again. Mm -hmm. I really so, believe that. So you're the guy with the trivia and the information and the behind the scenes stuff. I know that, I, I, if I'm right, her first record was on Murr Records, is that right? Well, this is an interest, it was, this is an interesting piece too. And she and I did not talk about this. So okay. I've got to go back to Terry because yes, originally um, the album was on Murr, and then a year later, 84, they issued it on Dayspring, and she uh, was a Dayspring artist. I knew she and was I, a Dayspring artist, yeah, for the second album. I think that, in fact, because my pressing of A Call to Us All is a um, Dayspring. Oh, interesting, okay. And so what I believe happened, and she did reference this in our conversation, yeah, it's Dayspring. Okay. Um, what I believe happened, though, was they shut down the word office in LA after her record initially came out. And I'm wondering if that was an early incarnation of what was Mer LA. Oh, right, right, which right. Which then got reformed later. Oh, I so remember I think, that now. That's bringing back stuff about Leslie Phillips. I think that the turning was on Mer LA. That's right. <laughs> okay, yeah. And they were more progressive. Right. Uh, more, Actually. you know, uh, yeah, I mean, we had Tony Okay, uh, who came through uh. that Mer oh, LA, what works. subsidiary? Mm -hmm. uh, we're really speaking in tongues, Matt. This is I know. for anybody that wasn't around. Ideola, remember Ideola? Ideola, of course, Mark Heard. Yeah. Mark Heard, yes. Um, and so I think that's what happened with Terry. I think she got shifted over when the the management of the label changed. Okay. Um, and 
interestingly, and there's a Patsy Moore connection again, because Neil Joseph, mm -hmm. uh, who ran Warner Alliance, uh, also ran Dayspring when Terry was on it. Interesting. So, so I was I was remembering this is just another little, I don't know, fun thing, but do you remember the Dayspring artist put out a single called Just What You're Looking For? Huh? Yes, I, in fact. Of course you do. Look. Of course you do. Yes. That, that I remember, like, I, I'm, I'm remembering those kind of like event marketing single type things like that, that we don't have those today. Like kids would be so, no. like, what, what is this? Some stupid song by all of the artists of Dayspring, like each contributing a line. That's so unheard of in, in this world today. But back then, it made sense, you know? And we had things like the, the Friends medley with Kathy Tricoli and Michael W. Smith. And, you know, just these odd the kind marketing. of marketing things, you know? The marketing was genius back then because uh, we had KT and Michael, we yeah. had uh, Steve Taylor and Sheila Walsh transatlantic yes. remixes. Yes, we had um, uh, there was also the uh, Mur the Voices compilation that you know had Tata Vega, Bob Carlisle, oh, yes. um, all these artists that were not Mur artists. But right. somebody said, you know what? These are great singers. We should put them all on one album and have them do an original song each. Wouldn't that a great, be a great idea and a great way to spend money? And they made a classic record. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I miss the innovative ideas. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not, well, I won't say that. Uh, <laughs> I think I have that that just what you're looking for single somewhere digitally too. So I'm gonna have to go back and listen to that. And I believe Terry co-wrote or wrote it, okay. if I'm not mistaken. Um, and let's also talk about on voices while we're talking about this, uh, you know, insertion of the sacred feminine into these songs. The idea behind voices in the wind as uh, really to me, when I think about reconciling myself to myself uh, in my teens, you know, out songs change meanings as you get her and your understanding that the world changes. Yeah, and so when I first heard Voices in the Wind as a 10 year old, the thing I heard that I needed to hear was deep inside, I know I'm good. Mm. Mm -hmm. And I think that speaks to some of the shame that you talked about feeling and experiencing uh, as a, as a, you know, little gay boy growing up in the church. Yeah. As I got older, I started digging into these liner notes because she was really giving us a trail yeah. to follow. So she quotes in this, uh, there's a bunch of spoken things happening in this song. I wish I could play them. So I'm not playing excerpts because uh, we do want to load this later uh, and it'll get flagged for yeah. copyright. And so I want to, you know, encourage people for the time being while these albums are not available to go to YouTube because you can find all of these songs there. People have graciously loaded really good conversions. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you can hear these songs there. If you just look up Terry Desario and Voices in the Wind and A Call to Us All, the songs from these albums should come up for you. Yeah. Uh, but Terry left us these breadcrumbs. So she's quoting Hildegard of Bingen, you know, a mystic. Uh, the first seed of the longing for justice blows through the soul like the wind. Uh, Teresa of Avila, self-knowledge is of such importance that even if you were to be raised to the highest heavens, I should not want you to stop your cultivation of it. Uh, Julian of Norwich, God has placed his nature in you holy in fullness and power in beauty and goodness in nobility and every manner of preciousness and mm -hmm. honor. And she ends this culmination of voices with God looked at everything that he made and it was good. good. Yep. Changed my mm. life, you know, mm -hmm. multiple times because wow. this is what I would come back to. Uh, in my teens. This is what I would come back to in my 20s. This is mm -hmm. what I would come back to in my 30s. This is what I came back to last week. Mm -hmm. You know, these mm -hmm. these messages, and I would, I started reading, uh, I would started looking for Hildegard of Bington and finding her diaries, you know, mm -hmm. that are published. Uh, Meister Eckhart. I mean, just yeah. these brilliant, brilliant thinkers that she was inserting into the Christian music narrative, right, and just such important, important 
uh, work, but it's rev it is still revolutionary to tell someone that they are whole. Yeah, it is because that is that runs counter to an evangelical understanding of of humanity. Uh, it is it is a central foundational doctrine for most conservative Christians that deep inside we are not good. Deep inside we are broken and sinful and we need a savior because we are hopeless and helpless without a savior. And that is that is something that is really deeply internalized by most evangelicals from the time they were children, you know, and that was that was definitely a part of my life. I am dirty, I'm broken, e even in a lot of CCM music and certainly today in a lot of worship music written for the church to sing. Absolutely. There are so many uh, examples where it's like, I mean, from Amazing Grace on, right? The save what? A wretch. I was a wretch. I was a worm. <laughs> there, people look at the, the scripture that says, you know, all of our righteousness is as filthy rags next to God. And there's almost a kind of, um, I don't know, like a, a kind of masochism in it. Like, I'm, I'm awful. I'm terrible. I'm, I'm a worm. I, I don't deserve your love, God. Oh, oh, oh. You know, and all this kind of like hand-wringing over what a horrible person I am and how lucky I am that he just like gives me even the, the little tiny bit of attention you know and, and it's it's uh it, it's deeply damaging over over time um and especially like sometimes I think about how theology works you know and and for some people theology works usually they're white and straight and middle class and you know what I mean? They've got enough money. They're safe in their world. They've got a job. Like evangelical theology works for people like that. There's no trouble in it. Yes. Right. But you know what? It yes. didn't work for me. It didn't work for you because no. there was something about us that was different from our parents or different from our church fellows, you know? And, and so, so we have to get to the point of saying, that you know what? Actually, I'm going to claim this as a good and beautiful thing in me, you know? But yeah, that, yes. that's... And it's terrible. I, I shouldn't do this, but I rewrite lyrics all the time for my church. I refuse to sing or lead people in singing songs that disparage us and call us, you know, worms and talk about how, how we don't deserve God's love. That's, that's a damaging and harmful message. And it's time I, for it yes. to stop. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's part of the reason and I don't, I'm not on any one person or anything like that when I say this, but it is why worship music is has been um, repellent yeah. for me yeah. in many ways. I mean, the minute that trend started and I started hearing the songs about being messed up and broken and um, lost, yes. and I just went, no, mm -hmm. no, that's not my reality. I mean, right. it right. used to be when I lived in that world and that mm -hmm. was my thing, um, but it's not my reality anymore. And I refuse to participate in right. reinforcing those values. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we had to burn rock records when I was a kid uh, because the messaging was so harmful. Then I've got a few other records that um, I think could be thrown in the pile <laughs> that um, are spreading damaging messages. And yeah. so for other reasons. Right, exactly. Uh, so to hear a Terry and, and, you know, she did it. This album was so about, she called this, uh, acknowledge, uh, she did a lot of study in, um, self-confrontational awareness. Mm. And so when we hear songs like tapestry, you know, about our interconnectedness with yes. one another, again, it's the same, a call to us all. Things. It is. Yeah. Um, truth. Mm, I love that she made truth one. a woman. Yes, I do too. I do too. She made truth a woman, and that made me happy. I remember uh, when Tapestry, I mean, yeah, when, when the second album, Voices, came out, I, um, I, I had this really kind of like cool English teacher at my Christian school. And she was young, and she was divorced, which is a little scandalous. Yeah. But she was like really cool. And she like introduced me to like Broadway musicals and some great, reading and plays and so I really owe her quite a lot for kind of expanding my mind at the time but I remember bringing her this album and showing her the lyrics because I I was genuinely questioning I was I was saying like I don't I don't know how I feel about this like I knew that I wanted wow. these things to be true but wow. I also knew that my world was telling me that they weren't true and so I was pretty skeptical of them even though I was hopeful I didn't experience it in exactly the same way as you do I loved it 
deeply, deeply, but I, I was a little afraid of it. I was a little like, mm -hmm. this, this is heretical. This is not, this is not orthodox, you know? And I remember taking the, the album to her and she did have some problems, you know, she was also from the same world. And um, yeah, she, that truth was one. She says, we, we can't use feminine pronouns for God. God revealed himself as a man, but you know, I remember so clearly, and this is what, 35 years ago, but I, you know, wow. I remember she said that, and she also was very against, uh, I don't want to be a soldier. She thought that that was, you know, just, she's just, she's just, you know, whatever, raising her fist in the face of, of God's plan, whatever, you know, because she was still very like wow. Republican and Ronald Reagan. And so th those, wow. those were dangerous messages. But yes. I remember thinking, I don't really care what she thinks, even though I obviously <laughs> did. Obviously I did, because I went to her and asked. But there was something in me that knew, even back then, I just knew. And it took a long, long, long time for me to finally get to the place where I am now. But, but it was because of things like Terry's albums, those beautiful lyrics that spoke to my heart. And I knew, I recognized truth, right? Just like the lyrics of that song say. I knew it. When you know that you know that you know, it's truth, right? It's true. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I, I also think it's important to note that she talks about um, <laughs> the dangers of capitalism. Yes. In, uh, <laughs> Very <laughs> subversive. How did this album get made, Tim? <laughs> was the last, well, and I, I also want to talk about the fact that it was her last one, and that was her choice Yeah. Uh, as oh, well. Okay. I didn't know that. Yeah. It was, she left on her own accord early, uh, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken, and at the height. I mean, this album also somehow got a Grammy nomination. Yeah. And um, she left on her own because she just saw what was coming and then she just said, I'm not a part of, this is not who I am. Mm, okay. This is not who I am. And so I think she, I think the one thing she would have encountered, and this is me being prophet, a little bit here. I think that had she continued, she would have experienced some um, more intensive censorship. Mm -hmm. uh, because two years later, um, you know, the church would encounter a um, reckoning, you mm -hmm. know, of sorts, and it changed Christian music, that mm -hmm. experience. To me, I make that the marker. Mm -hmm. um, of what changed for Christian music because the, I feel like the, the gatekeepers, and I could be wrong, I'd love to talk to some other people who've worked in the business this long um, and get their opinion. But I feel like when, but yeah, so uh, we were talking about- um, It was like 1987 and the scandals that the hit. The scandals that hit. And I feel like the gatekeepers um, decided rather than be real mm. and rather than um, acknowledge to the world, yes, Christians make mistakes, things mm -hmm. happen. Uh, to me, it was a great opportunity to yeah. be real, to yeah. be, you know, Jesus. Yeah. yeah. You know, and to show like what grace and mercy are for. And instead, uh, they chose to go inward and take the music back mm -hmm. and target it to the people that were easy to reach. Yeah, my opinion. I could be very wrong. That that sounds like a, a topic of conversation for a whole other. <laughs> that that's fascinating. Yeah. So because of that, I mean, we also then had the rise of much more mainline groups, and we had, you know, I don't want to name names of people that I felt like were really mainline, um, but we also come on, come on have... spill the tea. <laughs> but we also had because I don't want to, you know, my. I, I feel like safer is probably the better way. The safer choices we had a we had for him. We had um, you know grace. the point of grace. Those kinds of very clean, very you know groups emerged, and we lost the at the time we lost the Kathy Tricolis, we lost the Chris Eatons, we lost mm -hmm. um, the the edgier people, you know. Yeah. And then we would have, of course, um, people like Patsy Moore. Um, and, and those beautiful little moments where we got some really beautiful and unique personalities yeah. and music, you know? Yeah, but that was, to me, that was really the end of it. Um, 
And so I feel like Terry really got to leave on a high note. <laughs> he did, absolutely. With these two glimmers yeah. of, and here we are, and I want to connect this really, you know, swiftly to um, the things that are also departing uh, from the mainline world now. So we have a Derek Webb and we have um, yeah, the, uh, the uh, liturgists and we have Gunger and we yeah, have... Yeah. You know, people like this that we now we have a name. Now they're you know deconstructionists right. and evangelicals. Um, evangelicals, mm -hmm. and I always you know when I when I see those kinds of things, which I'm thrilled are there and so happy they're there. I always want to point them back. I know, yes. And go, this is your mother. Mm -hmm. Like this is you know, this was one of the stones on the path that I feel yeah. like you know we get a lot. We get very busy saying thinking we're the first. To oh do my things. goodness, you are so right, Tim. Like I, I was a part of a um, kind of gay Christian worship collective not too long ago. And one of the things that I called out was, we're not the first to do this. Like mainline no. churches have been celebrating and blessing queer identities and relationships for like 50 years, you know, <laughs> and more in some cases. So yeah, the evangelicals are, are finally starting kind of to, to tiptoe down this road. And that's wonderful and amazing wonderful. but they can't they can't claim to be like groundbreaking you know we're we're really really late to the ball game really yeah. late yeah i mean i yeah every time i the two people i always go back to in terms of knowing I, when i hit a particular age and i said you can walk away mm. you know from this world if that's what you choose to do and my model my models were the Terry Desarios and the Leslie Phillips, because those were the two people I knew that got out. Yep. And they were With, in, like really, really in. Just really, like really. Were, just like you were, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, you know, I am grateful for those signposts because it saved my life. It didn't just change my life. It saved yeah. my life. I, I, I mean, I can't imagine, um, what would have happened to me um, if I had stayed in being outside? You know, it's like, you know, I, when I was in academia, I did a lot of work around the outsider, you know, within the outsider inside. Um, and that's what really, that's what I think so many of us have been in that world. And now there's pockets that thank God are opening up um, for people that aren't, fundamentalists but you know that are identifying in many different ways in terms of where their faith is yeah. um and so we don't have to necessarily have a name but we do have community and we do have uh, people that can say i don't care if you're seeking i don't care if you're an atheist i don't care where you are in your journey but you know let's be community yeah and let's, let's be together home. let's explore together let's reminisce together let's heal and recover together right yes yeah and that's Absolutely. the key and so i my prayer my real prayer are for um younger people that are in that world that are you know questioning um their values their belief systems uh to write music out of that experience mm -hmm. i mean that is so helpful to anyone who's on the path you know, to hear somebody that can put a lyric together that summarizes um, the questions. I think it's just vital and key. And I'm, I'm thinking about the lyric from uh, Ain't Given Up No Way. And you already talked about breadcrumbs, like she, she dropped them behind, but, that, but it, it expresses yes. that. Never know next what I'll find, so I'm dropping breadcrumbs behind. And I love the lyric that, you know, on this road of love, it gets hard sometimes. Tears come stealing my sight. Oh, I'm trying to remember. But though this road is darkest at the center line, one thing's clear as day. I ain't given up no way. And and that's like that that is such a beautiful testimony to me. I, I don't care like where she is or where she got to or what her theological stance was at that particular point in time. What interests me far more than that, even now as a pastor, even now as a professing Christian, but, but a much more like agnostic mystical Christian, you know, uh, 
I, I love that perspective. That's my, per I'm not giving up. I'm going to continue to press forward. I'm going to continue to think and pray and hope and dream and read and explore. And I'm not going to be afraid of things that challenge orthodoxy because that's where we often find truth, you that's know? Right. And so I love that kind of pilgrim mentality. And that is what I finally have embraced for my own self. And it's a really, it, it's a really comfortable and right place for me. And I honestly don't know where I'll end up. I don't know. I don't have a preconceived idea of kind of who I'll be or what I'll believe five years from now, 10 years from now, whatever. All I know is that I'm on this journey. I'm not giving up. I'm not. I, I can't right. give up. And I'm so grateful for people like you and many others who walk this road with me. And it's not about uh, like a litmus test for orthodoxy. It's about like, we are together in this and we're gonna keep moving forward and, and right. be the community to one another. And I, I think that's, that's right. beautiful. And I, for me, that's a faith building thing. That to me is like evidence of, of God and of love and of, of a, a, a benevolent force in the universe that I like to call God. You know, that's one of the places that, that I see God at work is in relationships like even you and me, when I look back to 15 years of knowing you on social media of all things. My space. What? Right. But look at this, and, and I'm so encouraged by it. I love stuff like this, builds my faith. Yeah, well, I'm grateful. And I, you know, we have so many more albums that um, <laughs> I know have to, we, you know, that we, I hope you'll come back and have another talk with me. I would me. love to, um, really fun. And I really just, again, want to encourage everybody listening, go to YouTube and look up Terry DeSerio, A Call yeah. to Us All, Voices in the Wind. Those two albums are going to speak to you where you are. Um, and challenge you uh, if you're really certain about a lot of things. Uh, and that's what the music is for. I want to point everybody one more time uh, back to uh, the- Ray. Hi, Ray. What's that? Hey, Ray. <laughs> <laughs> I want to link everybody, send everybody back to the link in my bio. It's a list of resources. If you are protesting or want to be involved in, um, you know, march in, uh, speaking out against uh, police violence and police brutality uh, and racism in this country. Uh, there's a list of resources in my bio for attorneys, for protesters that need counsel, instructions on what to do if you are detained, uh, sharing methods that are most helpful on social media, places you can donate if you're able. Um, the list is organized by state, so you can find where you live and by the type of organization. Um, it was sent to me by Odessa Moon, great organizer here in Nashville, and I know she shared it from someone else's profile that I don't know. Uh, but I do encourage you to follow Odessa Moon. I am Odessa Moon is her handle. Uh, and again, the link for that Google Doc is in my bio. We are grateful to everyone that is speaking out and using your voice in whatever way you are. Yes. Whatever way you are, uh, we're grateful. And I hope you will continue to do so. There's a call to us all. Mm -hmm. Amen. To love all humanity. And that's what we're going to do. So until next time, we'll be back in two weeks. Uh, and I meant to grab the record we're going to talk about, but my husband Ray and I are going to talk about, uh, since we started with Terry DeSerio and uh, a feminist perspective on Christianity, we're going to go all the way over and talk with, about an album by an artist named Meg Christian who was a lesbian feminist, uh, women's music artist, uh, who also uh, touched on issues of the day in the 70s and uh, with all women musicians on a women-run record label, wow. Olivia Records. So join us in two weeks, uh, Thursday in two weeks, whatever day that is, but you'll see a flyer. Uh, not good with the calendar, but two weeks. <laughs> 18th, uh, June 18th. That's right, June 18th. Uh, and we got some exciting conversations coming up. Pam Mark Hall is going to come on and do a uh, conversation with me about her album Keeper. Um, I don't know if Pat I love that album. That's you love that great. album? I love that. Was my first Pam Mark Hall album. Yeah. Really? Okay. Oh, this is going to be yeah. fun. This is oh, going to be fun. And, and you know what? Uh, this is so random. Just sorry. It's it's a no. nerd kind of thing. So you said something about uh, Terry's songs on the Imperials' "Let the Wind Blow" album. Yes. So I went and kind of was looking through Imperial stuff today and I found the album This Year's Model. Do you remember that? This Year's oh, Model. I did too. Amazon. I was going to say that. I heard her voice in the first track. I was like, that is Pam Markall. It's Pam Markall.
thank you. I just so we'll talk. We will talk about the Imperial song when she comes on. Yes. Uh, because she has great story about that session, oh. and uh, yeah, I don't want to ruin it. I want. I kind of want to, but yeah. I won't. Uh, I'll, let her but, tell yeah. her. I'll, I'll tune in and listen. We'll talk I about. So we're gonna, it's very. Distinct. We're going to talk about um, Keeper. And then uh, my friend Monica Burris uh, Page uh, now from uh, the Voices of East Harlem and Barry Manilow's group Lady Flash is going to be with me in July. And we're going to talk about the Lady Flash album, Beauties in the Night. So we've got some fun, fun stuff. I'm so grateful to you, Matt, for being my first I'm first so friend guest on, on this little series we're starting. Just, really you know, fun. for whoever has ears to hear. That's so. right. That's right. Nerds Thanks. unite. You know, anytime. And and yes, you have to come back. And okay. uh, also, uh, Patsy's still here. I mean, we're going to have to talk about, I mean, there's so many Patsy's music, I've, oh my God. which is also a, a common denominator for us. Yeah. Um, you know, Patsy's last record, I just have to do a shameless plug, uh, What Surprises Us, is really, really gorgeous and um, should be a record we talk about as well. So... Maybe Patsy will come on. We'll see. All right. Sounds good. All right, Matt. Have a good Thank night. You, my friend. you too. This has been fun. I'll talk to you all soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Hey, everybody. Thanks for watching the first Have You Ever Heard. I hope you'll join us again on Thursdays, every other Thursday, live on Instagram, or you can always catch them here on YouTube. So I hope you'll give us a thumbs up and uh, subscribe to our channel, Imagination Fury Arts. Until the next time. Bye.